risen. He's risen indeed. I was buried beneath my shame. my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. And all my failures I tried to hide. It was my Hosanna, he rose from the grave And come and live 
肩膀，不再那。Let the lost be found, forgiven. Death could not hold him down. He's risen. Let each cry out at us. We worship you. We worship you. And shout, Hosanna! Jesus, He saves. Shout, Hosanna! He rose from the grave. Come and lift him up, Hosanna! Shout, Hosanna! Jesus, He saves. And shout, Hosanna! He rose from the grave. Come and lift him up, Hosanna! That rolled the stone away. Same power alive in us today. King Jesus, we call upon your name. No other name. Same power. Same power. The lie of the stone away. Same power alive in us today. King Jesus, we Call upon your name, no other name. We shout, we shout, Hosanna, Jesus, He saves. Shout, Hosanna, He rose from the grave. Come and lift Him up, Hosanna. Shout, Hosanna, Jesus, He saves. Shout, Hosanna. From the grave, come and lift him up. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. As we look out this morning, Jesus has already conquered the, the grave. He's conquered death on our behalf. And I think sometimes we kind of forget that, that the tomb is fully empty. He is not present here. <laughs> he is not present here. This was not his home. And so we read in 1 Corinthians 15, about what we can declare about the resurrection today. It's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. But tell, tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would be all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. I'm going to read that one more time. That can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is ultimately useless. And you're guilty of all of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in this world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And he is the first of the great harvest of all who died. Thank you, Jesus. sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God has
has been on Jesus lay in silent as he stood accused beaten mocked and scorned and bowing to the Father's will he took salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee in sense of the very ones who nailed him to that tree. And oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah. And honor unto me. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee lots to be excited about here The stone is rolled away. That's right. Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God be praised. He's risen from the grave. Oh, that rugged cross. and honor unto thee. Praise and honor unto thee. Praise and honor. Praise and honor unto thee. Amen. Everybody who God is risen from the dead, let him know. If you're not excited about Jesus being alive, you're dead. So don't be dead. Be full of the glory of God this morning. Let's praise God. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don't be Don't worry about
about what the person next to you is thinking. Don't worry about what I'm thinking. For goodness sakes, I hardly think. Just go ahead and praise God. One more time. Amen. Father God, we are just so grateful. We are grateful, Lord God, because we can come together, we can gather, and we have a purpose. And on this day, we celebrate our reason for gathering as a people. Lord God, it's not Christmas. Lord God, it's not the 4th of July. Lord God, it's not any other holiday we can think of. It's all about your resurrection because life eternal is the gift of God to man. And we accept that today by the power of the blood of Jesus and by his, by his resurrection. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Say hello to somebody next to you. Hey, God bless you all. Just want to remind everybody before we get any further, please fill out your connection cards if you're here either for the first time or if you have a prayer request. Anna and I do pray over what comes in through that. So we want to um, keep that, you know, keep that going. So if you've had a change of address or any of that kind of stuff, you know, make sure you fill out one of those connection cards. There should be one near you. If not, uh, let an usher know and they'll get you one. Um, it, you know, it's one of the three days a year I'm guaranteed to be in some kind of a jacket like this. All right? It's the one that makes most people cringe the most because of its color. But hey, how many times in the course of a year do Sue and I match? It looks like Sue and I called each other and said, well, what are you wearing to church today? Well, I'm wearing, you know what I mean? Bless God. So enjoy it while you can. Because it's not going to be normal. Because back to, next week I go back to being who I'm normally dressed like. So anyway, praise God. It's so good to be here um, on, on this day. And, and, the, and given what we're celebrating, um, it's absolutely just an awesome, awesome moment for each and every one of us. I want to ask the ushers to come forward because we're going to receive our offering. And we want to get right into where we're going here this morning. So let's just pray. Father God, we do, as we have said, Lord God, we do thank you for this glorious, wonderful day. We ask, Lord God, that we would understand that that glory and that wonder doesn't come because it's not raining, because the sun might be out or anything like that, but it's because there is life in our hearts that has come as that free gift to us from you. And so, God, we ask that as these offerings are given, that you, Lord God, would be able to use these for your kingdom's sake and that a blessing for this community, for this place, and for any reach we have would be expanded as the tent pegs of your kingdom. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Gentlemen. miss the children now and I just want to say kids this isn't just an adult thing going to church Jesus loves you he cares about you deeply so we're going to pray for you today so in the name of Jesus Father God we lift up our children to you Lord we pray a blessing on them we pray Father God that they would experience your love and the reality of who you are today and we pray it in Jesus holy name amen Amen. Thank you.
So, I am definitely jacked up because it's Resurrection Day, okay? I'm so jacked up, I almost knocked one of these lilies over a couple of minutes ago, but uh, praise the Lord, I did not. Um, so, we're going to uh, wrap up the series of, of being on the road to resurrection today, and we're going to look at uh, some of the basics at, at, of what we're talking about today. You know, of course I'm saying happy resurrection day to each and every one of you. Let me ask you something. This, ser- this sermon is titled, Ever See a Miracle? And I'm asking you the question, have you ever seen a miracle? Now, Anyone who says that they're a Christian will naturally say, well, yes, I'm sure I have. Even people who may not even follow the Lord might say, oh, yeah, I've seen a miracle. But does the word miracle even have the meaning for us today that it has biblically? I mean, so I, last, last night, Anna and I watched, uh, we had gotten a, um, a, uh, a link to watch the um, sight and sound production of Jesus on the TV, right? Which to me, watching sight and sound on TV is always something of a disappointment because it's not like you're being in the room, you know what I mean? When you're sitting in a theater and a horse walks by, you gotta be like impressed by that, you know? When you're sitting in your living room, I'd be more impressed if a horse walked into my living room, <laughs> right? But I mean, so, and, and let, you know, you guys know, I, 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 you know, my past and, and the acting and all that, I'm really critical of acting and all, which is why I never do church productions because people would leave the church if I directed and did that kind of stuff. So I'm really kind of critical on that kind of thing and all. But we watched this one and, and it started out and, and, and it was kind of like, yeah, this is sight and sound on TV. You know what I mean? And it, it wasn't like thrilling me. But then I realized, and, and they take lots of liberty. All right, they're trying to tell a story, but I recognize it's a, it's a production. It's meant to be a show. It's not supposed to be for people like me who want them to actually, you know, give Greek definitions during the middle of it. You know what I mean? I get it that, that they're trying to, because they're, com, they're combining things that Jesus said with things that he said at other times, and the context to me is like, what the heck are you doing? You, you know, but what I noticed about it was when they went through the life of Jesus, All they did was go miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And before I knew it, I'm sure my wife knew it, but but we don't talk. We sit on the couch together, but I don't talk about it. But I mean, I'm just streaming. Because I cannot think about those miracles. I can't think about those regular people, people just like you and me. People when a leper who is shunned and kept away, and Jesus just touches him, and all of a sudden, it's gone. When somebody born blind has mud put on their eyes and told to go and wash in a pool, and he washes, and boom, he can see. Born blind and now can see. When these things happen, when we read the biblical concepts of miracles, we think of things in the Old Testament, you know, the parting of the Red Sea, and all these miracles... It's just enormous, but when you think about how personal the miracles Jesus did were, it's huge. And anyone who has seen that will understand that. But I'm not just talking about what sometimes we think the meaning of the word miracles is, you know, surprising events of life or difficult projects which work out. I mean, you know, you all heard, right? You've all been in that work thing, that work situation where something, I'm going to knock this plan over. I'm, I'm so used to coming over here. This is, this is, keep this in mind for next year. All right. Anyway, so, and, and when I do knock it over, well, I'm just going to let it sit. I'm just telling you right now. Anyway, getting back to the point. You know, we've all had like a, a work project where, where, you know, all of a sudden you're thinking it's never going to work out and it works out. And you go, man, it was a miracle that that worked out. Really? You know, I've heard some women say, man, it's a miracle my husband didn't say anything stupid in that moment. (laughs) Right? Is that a miracle? Well, maybe. But anyway, that's not the kind of miracle I'm talking about. We we classify miracles as almost anything. And some believers have, have, especially within our own uh, Pentecostal charismatic movement, you've got people who think a miracle has to mean that somebody's leg grew. 
You know what I mean? Or that some guy with a, with a wild hairdo and a funny looking suit is, is saying something that's making somebody do something reactive. I mean, I'm not telling you that God doesn't move in those moments. He does. I've seen them. But what I am telling you is I'm not talking about that kind of miracle this morning. I'm talking about what's contrary to human possibility type events. By definition, we understand the type of miracle, I mean, doesn't happen every day. Now, granted, miracles should be happening for us every day because if we're people of faith, then we should be walking and living in miracles because even Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do, right? So that we shouldn't be so like shocked by miracles. Miracles should be kind of normal for us. That's why the miracles I'm talking about are even abnormal for those who know miracles, all right, or out of the norm for those. These are the miracles. Ain't nothing happening. I can't swim a lick. Yeah, I tried walking on it. Didn't work out so well for me. You know what I'm saying? But this, what we're talking about today, this is rare, very rare. And when they do happen, they can be difficult at times for us even to believe them. And the reason, of course, it's hard for people to believe is partly due to their infrequency and also partly because we can't explain them. We live in a day and age where everybody wants to explain everything, right? I mean, the battle now between what scripture and what science says is ridiculous. I mean, there's, no, there's enough out there to, to venerate, to actually validate the truth of scripture with proof, but you never hear about it because the talking heads and the news media and everybody is always constantly pushing stuff. I have changed my opinion on things. I remember I thought I was so smart, before, right before I got saved, literally right before I met Jesus, I was living a, a really nasty life and, and my mother was, was talking to me. My mother wasn't like the greatest Christian ever walked, the, you know, she was pretty nominal Catholic and all that kind of stuff. And, and I drew this picture of what I felt God was. And it was a picture of the planet Earth, and in the distance was an old man with a, with a golden retriever, petting the golden retriever, sitting on a stool in obviously old man clothing. And I showed it to my mother, and I said, there's God. Too old to do anything about what's happening down there. Mom got tort. <laughs> but that's who I thought God was because I didn't understand. And then when you have people today trying to give all the science and evidence, I don't need the science and the evidence to have faith because my faith is not based on science. Listen, I used to be so proud of the fact that I used to say, another thing I would tell my mother is, you know, well, if Adam and Eve were the first one, isn't it possible that God knew they'd be first and that's why, you know, we had this guy, you know, the cro magnon and, the, you know, all this other kind of nonsense. And my mother would be like, you know, next thing you know, the rosaries are broken out and a priest is getting a conversation and it's just out of control, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that it's right there in scripture. I don't have to worry about it. And so people freak out, for example, you know, the Bible says that the earth is 6,000 years old. And people go, well, it can't be. We've got fossils. Quite frankly, you've got fossils in this room, but I'm not going to mention you. The truth of the matter is, we also believe that Adam, though we believe Adam was the first man, amen? amen? Think about it this way. If Adam, Adam didn't start as a baby and have to grow into being a man, did he? God started him as a fully formed, complete man. Is there a reason why he can't com complete and, and create a fully formed, having functioned world? Why are we limiting God just to argue with Neil deGrasse Tyson and other words I can't say in the pulpit, people. <laughs> Miracles, even in the Bible, that are so extraordinary are not an everyday occurrence. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. And I'm going to start reading at uh, verse... 45, as soon as I find my glasses. Another reason why I don't wear jackets, I have too many pocket options. 
Starting at verse 45. At noon, this is the death of Jesus, at noon darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had, li- who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man was, truly was the Son of God. You see, Jesus' resurrection is the kind of miracle I'm talking about today. It's unexplainable by any human or natural means. That might be why we don't talk about it as much, because we can't explain it. The crucifixion can be understood, not so much the resurrection. We know about crucifixion because we have all the historical evidence of how the Romans did crucifixions. We know how it happened, and we know how it was carried out. We know who caused it, and we know who nailed him to the cross physically. Amen? We get that. You don't need to be convinced of that. It's not the only resurrection, by the way, from the dead in history. That's the other thing that sometimes lessens what we think. There have been reports of cults that have brought people back to life. Did you know that? There are weird, distant cults in jungles, places, or whatever, who have claimed, and people say they saw them bring back the dead to life. There are at least 10 other resurrections from the dead in the Bible. One of those happened right in this passage we read, when the, when the tombs were open up and all those people were raised from the dead. And then there's the story of Lazarus. Amen? I mean, there's plenty of people. Jesus was obviously not the first, but yet he's, the, he's told, the scripture says that he's the firstborn of the resurrection. You see, the distinction with Jesus is rising, why it's not like any other resurrection that ever happened before or since, why his death is different than any other death before or since, why it's not that somebody else could get crucified and beaten and all that other kind of stuff. What's different about it is he rose on his own. Every other resurrection required somebody to do something. Somebody had to say, Lazarus, come forth. Somebody had to say, child, Talitha, rise. Somebody had to say something. Somebody had to do something. Jesus rose from the dead by his own volition, by his own power, because he's God. It is not like, wow, did I slip into an Italian guy right there? It is not. It is not just that it was a resurrection. It was the resurrection, the promised resurrection. No prophet, no cult, anyone has ever, nobody else was ever around when he, he rose of his own power. The proof that we can't explain, explain it is simply this. You want to know why we can't explain it? Why we understand crucifixion better than the resurrection? People walk around today wearing crosses on chains, right? Ever see anybody running around with a tomb, an empty tomb on a chain? Not so much, because we can't explain it. Because somebody's going to go, what the heck is that? It's an empty tomb. What are you, crazy? (laughs) Yeah, you know, we we just kind of back down to that. So let me ask again, do you believe in miracles? Don't worry. If you're the least bit unsure, you're not alone. Of course, many deny miracles today. They call them myths. They call it the myth of creation, the myth 
of the flood, even though there's so much evidence piling up scientifically even about the flood, all over the world, there is evidence of a one moment. You find dinosaurs and, and ancient mammals that don't exist anymore, fish who are in the middle of eating or giving birth. They find the skeleton of both the, the fish that was eaten and the fish that was being eaten at the same moment. How many know that if it took a bazillion years to fossilize, it wouldn't have happened like that? Something happened. Something happened. And there's evidence of that all over the world. But because it doesn't fit the, the scientific explanation, it's rejected. God does not need man to validate what he does. The word of God doesn't need your permission to call it true. Amen? And it doesn't need mine, and it doesn't need the permission of anybody walking out there on the street. But I mean that there are those at the very first Easter Sunday who didn't exactly embrace the notion of... is actually saddled with the nickname Doubting Thomas, which I think is absolutely erroneous. It's such a, it's such a, a bad portrayal of Thomas. They make, every movie you ever see about Jesus, they always make Thomas out to be, well, a jerk, right? Everybody, he, he's a despicable character. I think Thomas was above all the rest in his understanding and what he was seeking to see and find out. I don't have enough time to be, maybe we'll do that some other day, but I think it's a shame that he, was, he would have been saddled with that. Because I'm asking the question, would you have doubted? Would we have doubted? What if it was a relative? What if somebody told you your grandmother, who's been dead for 30 years, rose from the dead and is walking around in downtown Bethlehem? Oh, let's go find Granny. That's not going to be the first thing out of your mouth. Right? Or if you're Italian, let's go get Nona. It's not going to work that way. Right? What would it take to convince you that someone you loved had come back to life. Rising from the dead is not common. And if we, if, if we had been with the disciples, we wouldn't have believed it either, and we wouldn't have believed the rumors. I mean, even the word rumor is a negative connotation for us, isn't it? If somebody says to you, oh, I heard this rumor, immediately you should be thinking, oh, I'm not going to gossip. But sometimes it's actually a true word. Sometimes they heard something that's true, but it's just so unbelievably wild, you can't believe it. Thus the unbelievably. How did they react to the news? Well, none of the disciples believed at first. Not just Thomas. Frankly, they weren't expecting a resurrection. Even after Jesus basically told them that he would be resurrecting, they didn't get it. Resurrection wasn't even on their minds. They didn't even have a conscious thought about it. Who was really expecting the res resurrection? The Pharisees. The Pharisees were nervous about a resurrection. Oh, sure, they went to the Romans and told them the story. You know, we don't want any of his disciples coming in and, and uh, stealing the body, so we need you. Can, can I just explain for a second? That tomb was sealed with the stone and the 12 of them by themselves in the dark and secret of night would have had a hard time getting that task done. And where are they going to take them? Right? The tomb is traditionally believed to be not far from Calvary's Hill. So where are they going to go? Where are they going to bring them? How are they going to do it? So they, the, the Pharisees persuaded the Romans to seal the tomb. We forget about that. They didn't just roll a big rock in front of it. They sealed it. They mortared it. They took mortar. It existed then, and they sealed the tomb. Air couldn't get in or out. It was sealed. It was not going to be a nanosecond, and for three days, or three nights, it stayed in that hardening and hardening and hardening. There's nobody coming around and pushing that thing away. It was a done deal. And the Pharisees wanted it that way 
Because here's the truth and the reality. The word of God is truth. Amen? Amen. They were familiar with the word of God up to that point. Amen? Amen? And they knew whether they denied it, whether they tried to hide it, they knew who he was. Which is why they are the condemned generation. Because they knew and rejected him. Wasn't that they knew after he rose, they knew. The enemies of Jesus feared something was going to happen. And by contrast, his friends weren't expecting anything. The women who went to the tomb after the Sabbath didn't have the slightest idea of what was going to happen. In Mark 16, 8, it says, The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Because they thought something bad had happened. They thought his body was stolen. John, even, John says that even Mary thought someone had stolen the body. It says in John 20, verse 2, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So even after they ran, got to the disciples, and they told them, hey, somebody stole his body. The rumor started. And it didn't start with the Pharisees. It started with the women. Don't get me started. I'll just throw that out there and run away. The disciples didn't even believe the women either. Luke 24, 11 says, but the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. Nonsense! The truth that Jesus already told them would happen, they decided was nonsense. Jesus said he would rise again. We all believed him when we read it, didn't we? Well... We, we, we knew a little bit more when we got to it than they did. And he had never been wrong before. He said he was the son of God. What about what Isaiah wrote? I want to read a passage that you're all very familiar with, but I want to, I'm hoping you're, you're going to hear it maybe slightly differently today, and that's Isaiah 53. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. All right? Jerry, I hope you can keep up. And... If I'm speaking too fast for you guys, pray for the anointing of fast hearing, okay? All right. So, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But we we, but he pierced, he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. Have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before its shearers, he said he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. And when he sees all that as a Accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. 700 years before the crucifixion, a prophet of God wrote those words. I spent my beginning days as a believer working with Jews for Jesus on the streets of New York City where there's lots of Orthodox Jews. And I can't tell you the number of times that I opened up Isaiah. These are people who went to entire school to memorize 
entire portions of the Bible. And I met them on the street, and I would tell you to them, Jesus is Lord, and they would tell me I didn't know what they was talking about, and I would open up with their Bibles that they carried with them. And I say, show me Isaiah 53. Let's read that out loud together. You're going to have to read it in English because I'm not going to catch it in Hebrew. But every now and then I would say, is that what it says in the Hebrew? Is that what it, and they'd say, yes. And the look of dumbfounding on their faces. And I know that some of them walked away. I don't know what happened to most of them. I can't tell you that I saw a bunch of them come to Jesus right in that moment. But I saw doubt. I saw shaken. I saw a tomb emptied in front of them. I saw a resurrection about to happen. And a decision that had to be made. You can't deny who that is about. You can put as much spin on that as you like. It is what it is. Amen? Amen. But let's be honest. Which one of us, had we been there at that time, could have cast that first stone at them for lying? Right? So we have to be moving from doubt to faith. That is what Easter is really all about. Last week I mentioned what Jesus said to Thomas in John chapter 20. Thomas' word to Jesus was the greatest apostolic testimony ever spoken. He said, then he said to Thomas, this is John writing, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. When you watch this in the movies, they always have, my Lord and my God. That's not what it says in the Greek. What it says in the Greek was, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. A little bit different, isn't it? Just a little bit. You believe, Jesus responded, because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. We should all be able to make Thomas's shout sound like a whisper. Because we are the blessed of God. Not because we deserve it. Not because we earned it. Not because it was our blood shed on that hill. But because our faith is not in the proof. Our faith is in the knowledge that is in our hearts by the movement of the Holy Spirit of God. It came from a man, Thomas, who may have had some doubts for sure, but those doubts stopped that day. He was not doubting Thomas. He was saved Thomas. He was man of God Thomas. He was apostle Thomas. He was miracle worker Thomas. He was, I'm giving my life for, Tom, for Jesus Thomas. So where do we fit in? What's our resurrection story? Can I, can I give just a personal testimony? Is that okay? I want to make sure everybody... I'm going to kick this point. I, wow, I can actually see, too. The lights are a lot less over. Anyway, so several months ago, January, I told you guys that I went through healing prayer. The culmination of 40 some odd years of walking with Jesus and not experiencing the fullness of resurrection in my life because I was bound by the sins and the tortures of my past. And I don't mean my far past. I mean my saved past. I was tormented by things that had been said and done and spoken, by actions, by hurts, by all of it. But in that moment, when Holy Spirit was freeing me, the people that were leading me through this prayer said to me, what is Holy Spirit saying to you right now? That room was so quiet. It was just me and two other people praying. And they asked me that question. They didn't say, come on, come on, what's the answer? What is he saying? They just waited. And I don't know how long it took before I said something because I'm, I'm trying to make sure I hear what he says and hear it correctly. 
And then, in my mind's eye, I had a vision. In that vision, I saw a gigantic tomb. And I walked in the tomb, and in the center of the tomb was this giant bag, like, like an old, like a, a Warner Brothers cartoon, you know, Roadrunner cartoon drawn bag, like canvas, giant canvas gray bag. It was dirty and dusty, and it was tied at the top by a chain, by shackles. And I looked at that, and I looked at the shackle, and it was connected to my arm. And then I looked, and I could see further into the cave, and inside the big giant cave were all these little caves. And Holy Spirit told me that that bag was filled of all the darkness that came out of me from out of each and every one of those caves. And in that moment, I was released. I heard the chain fall down at my feet. And Holy Spirit then said, turn and go out. That would have been good enough. I was pretty excited. But then Jesus said to me in my spirit, and here's the kicker. He said, remember, even the tomb I was raised from remained a tomb. Roll the stone and walk back in front of it and don't go in it anymore. Basically, seal it, keep it closed, and don't go back in it. And then I was kind of, you know, left with that. And I started praying about that. And I was asking God, what does that mean? I mean, I get some of it, but, but what's the point? And I realized that, you know, people think they know where the tomb was. You have some people that argue that it's the, the church of the sepulchre. You have some people argue that it's that garden tomb because it's near the... Um, uh, you know, Golgotha, the hill of the skull, is what literally Golgotha means. It now overlooks a bus station. You know, so there's all this diesel fume and everything by that hill, and there's a cemetery built on the hill of Calvary. Okay, but down and not too far from that is where that other one is. And there have been some people that have post posited other ideas of where that tomb is. But you know, the truth of the matter is nobody knows. Nobody knows. And what the Lord was saying to me was that even that tomb, it was Joseph of Arimathea. He died. He's in a tomb somewhere waiting. Maybe that very tomb. We have no proof. People think that that tomb was never used again. There's no reason to think that. The culture that used that tomb was far too practical and pragmatic to let that happen. But I said, all right, well, okay, Lord, that's something. But so what? And that's when he made me realize that too many of us have the concept of death and what the disciples thought of it kind of confused. And too many of us keep walking back into the tombs of our past. And on this Resurrection Sunday... We need to ask, are we trying to get back into our tombs of our past lives? Jesus ascended into heaven. He never had to enter the grave again. And if Jesus is still in the tomb, then he's not in our hearts. That's what that scripture Dave read earlier is all about. As Paul said in that very, in that very passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. We are those who are blessed because we haven't seen, but we believe. But I believe that we should stop going into those tombs. You know what I'm saying. I've prayed for that healing over and over and over again. Stop looking for healing in a tomb. I've prayed for that child to accept Jesus over and over again. Stop looking for salvation 
in a death tomb. I was wounded and hurt by this person with what they said. Stop walking back into the grave. Because that's where death resides. And we are the children of God. The disciples of life. The revealers of truth. The glory of a risen Savior. And the remainder of the resurrection. Our faith is not as some say. Some people define faith like this. They say, faith is that which we believe that we know isn't true. That's not faith for us. I don't believe in something that I know is not true. You can know, you can be sure, you can not only believe he is risen, you can believe and live as if you have been risen from the dead. And that you will one day literally and physically be risen from the dead. Amen? No matter what burden you've gone through in life, you can be resurrected this morning. You can accept life this morning. You can receive the resurrection of Christ this morning. We don't approach it enough like that. We look at it as something in the future. Like someday we all get to be meeting him in the air. Yes, we do. And some people may not experience death. But all of his closest ones, the ones that will sit on thrones and reign and rule and judge with him, all saw death and will be raised from the dead. But their spiritual resurrection, which is the same reason why we live in the kingdom of heaven already. Amen? Amen. Heaven has started for us. Heaven is not something I'm waiting to see. Heaven is something I'm walking in each and every day. If you walk with the Lord, you're walking in heavenly light. And if you believe in the resurrection of your Lord Jesus Christ, then you walk in a resurrected spirit. Amen? We've got a little baby we've been praying for. Little Stevie. I want to start calling him Stevie the Wonder. Because we're praying that his life isn't just spared. We don't want little Stevie to get a whew, dodge that bullet moment. We want him to grow up to be the greatest voice for God possible. Amen? We want him to grow up in resurrection life. We want to pray for the resurrection. He's near that death point, but he's not meant for that death point. Amen? But we need to believe that together. Stand with me, if you would. And we're going to sing. But I want to let you know that maybe you'll meet him in the air. Maybe you'll meet him not at physical death. But you can believe in miracles. You can actually be a miracle. We were not meant to just be people schlepping along the street. We were meant to be literal miracles. So, you ever see a miracle? Look at the person next to you. Boom, there's a miracle. Look at that. You see, not enough of you are looking. Do you understand? Looky, let me say it in Greek. Look at me next to they, okay? Those are miracles. You're all sitting amongst miracles. Each and every one of you is a miracle. Say, I'm a miracle. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a miracle. Say, we're all miracles. And believe. It's not about the proof. Let's face it. Look at us. There ain't no proof looking at these fat shepherds that we're all miracles. The miracle comes from the belief that we put in Jesus and his death and resurrection. It is not about being comfortable. It's about being bold for Jesus. Easter, resurrection day is the pinnacle of Christian belief. I had a pastor for years when I was on staff in my 40s. In your 40s, you think you know so much. You know nothing, but you think you know everything. You think teenagers think they know a lot? Men in their 40s think, I've got it all. And I had a pastor, I was on staff, and my pastor, who was, I think, 16 years, 17 years older than me, refused to call this Easter would correct me if I was in the foyer and people were coming into church and I said, Happy Easter. He would walk right up to me and say, Jim, stop propagating a lie. It's Happy Resurrection Day. We're not about bunnies and all that stuff. And listen, I am not going to now go into some tirade. I'm in pastels, okay? 
But I am going to tell you this, if you're more excited to watch some little children running around and opening up some plastic eggs, you're missing the point of the day. You are miracles. You are life. It's not about spring. It's not about weather changing. It's about life changing. It's about the beginning of life. It's about the future. You're going to be around Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, a heck of a lot longer then you're gonna be around bunnies and eggs. And we all know Pastor loves chocolate. So it's taken some restraint. Pastor also loves donuts. If I gotta walk by another donut today, I'm gonna to burst. But it's not about that stuff. And I'm not telling you all those things are cursed. But if your attention is on things and not on him, then you are living a curse instead of the resurrected life you were meant to live. So let's sing. And while we're singing, if you need resurrection, I want you to come forward. This altar is open. I know everybody's got something roasting in the oven right now. All right? Look, and if it's a ham, you're not kosher, stop it, okay? It doesn't matter. God is here. Amen? And I believe he wants to see some resurrection life begin today. So I'm just opening this up. No guilt, no condemnation, just an invitation. Let's sing. How great the chasm that lay between us. How great the mountain that I could not climb. In desperation, I turn to Spoke your name into the night, through the darkness, and through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ. My living Lord. Who could imagine? Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory. To wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. No claim on 
on me, let's Amen. declare that again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. And of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Logos, which literally means the word in Greek, and then there's rhema, which is that living life breath. That's the anointing and the breathing that happens when all of a sudden God fills you with the things. You ever talk to somebody and you know you don't have anything up here that's going to help them, but something instead comes out of your mouth and you're feeling like you have an out-of-the-body experience? Like, who the heck is saying that? That's the rhema. Father God, I ask right now, Lord God, that on this resurrection day, that the rhema of your spirit would descend upon these, your children. I pray that they would literally be showered in the blessing of Holy Spirit breath, that everywhere they go today, whether they spend it with family or go to any place, and from this day forward, may they speak life, the breath of life that has its source in you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for you did for us what we could not do. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for you took upon yourself what we could not let go. You did everything needed. And we thank you, Lord God, that we know what tomorrow brings. We don't know whether or not we'll have food to eat in the house to live in. But we know you will never leave us or forsake us. And that we have begun walking in heaven. And we will not stop walking. Because we are bound by the love of God. And we will not walk back into those tombs. We are sealing those tombs behind us. We are forgetting what's past. And we're looking instead for the prize ahead, declaring the glory of our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy Resurrection Day. God bless you.